Well, thanks everyone for being here. We'd like to welcome you to uh, Deaconess Gateway to our Ortho Neuro Tower. I'm Dr. James Porter, the president of Deaconess Health System, and I'm here with a very distinguished group um, to tell you about some exciting news involving a collaboration between Deaconess Health System and the IU School of Medicine Evansville to do a research study on the prevalence of COVID-19 in our community. As you all know, we know it's present, we know it's being spread person to person. What we don't know is how many people actually have it. And that's what this study is attempting to determine for a particular point in time, what is the prevalence of this virus and this infection in our community. So to tell us more about this study uh, and to give you some, I think, helpful and interesting details, uh, we have a number of folks here today and I'll introduce them one at a time some of them are faces that I'm sure you recognize, but I'll introduce them one at a time as they uh, give us some additional information about um, this exciting study. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Majid Koliolot, who is a Deaconess Clinic allergist and immunologist and will serve as the principal investigator for our study. Dr. Koliolot's going to give us some of the basic high-level information about the study itself. Thank you, Dr. Porter. The question we wanted to answer is what is the prevalence of this disease across our population with the concentration of the workforce? Uh, the 30,000 foot view is basically that we're going to try to test 1,000 people in a very short period of time. Over the next uh, five days, uh, we have online scheduling, more details about that, but I can tell you it's been very successful. We had more than 300 uh, people already sign up for the first couple of days, so we expect this to be a rapid fire, rapid result uh, event. We want to concentrate on the workforce, uh, making sure that we are selecting appropriate uh, cross section of the population with a good sampling so we get a good idea of what is going on. Uh, and it should be uh, quick and effective, and we should be able to get good results that will answer the questions is that, uh, that are mainly who has it, who has had it, uh, how does this impact the person's perception, they're going to say whether they think they have the disease or whether they truly have the disease, they're going to mention their comorbidities, uh, because that's a question that has not been answered. We know that the people who succumb to this disease have comorbidities, but no one's going around and asking the people who define what comorbidities have you had? Because as we know, 80% of people have a very um, uh, a mild uh, a process, whilst 20% have a significant process. And this is the population that everyone's concentrating on. We're going to try to see a broader view. Thanks, Dr. Khalil. I'm sure you'll have some questions. We'll hold those till the end, and then we'll direct those to the person best able to give you a good answer. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. April Abbott. Dr. Abbott is the Director of Microbiology for Deaconess Regional Laboratory. Dr. Abbott will serve as a sub-investigator for this uh, research and is going to tell us a little bit more about the specific tests that we're going to use and how they will work. Dr. Abbott. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Um, so the two tests that we're really looking at are the ones that you've probably already heard about. So the first being the um, collection of a nasal swab. So we're going to take a swab and collect a specimen from the nose and use that to look for the virus itself. So we're looking for those patients that maybe have preclinical or subclinical disease and be able to detect those patients that actively have virus in their nose. Um, the second piece of this is really to look at the um, ability for a person to produce an antibody response. So for that, we're going to collect a blood specimen. And that particular um, test really is not detecting the virus itself, but detecting the ability of the body to um, have a response to that pathogen. And so uh, between these two types of tests, it gives us a good picture of those individuals out in the population that currently have um, active novel coronavirus or COVID-19 um, versus those patients that maybe are, uh, have recovered from having that infection. And so it gives us a good snapshot in time of what the population looks like. And we're not going to be performing these tests here on site, but we've partnered um, with a reference laboratory in which we can get the samples to them and have the test performed at that laboratory with a really good turnaround time. So one of the reasons, Dr. Abbott, we're not doing those on site is we want to make sure that the tests locally with a quick turnaround are available for people who have COVID-19 locally and need that quick uh, determination. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. So one of the things that in designing the study that we were really cautious about is making sure that the local resources that we have for patients, patients that we know are coming to the hospital or healthcare workers or those in critical infrastructure, that we maintain our supply here locally to service those particular patient populations. And so we really strategically made a decision going in that we were not willing to um, perform research um, with use of those resources that we need locally currently. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kara Garcia. Dr. Garcia is a research navigator with the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute of the IU School of Medicine at Evansville. Dr. Garcia is going to tell us a little more about the sampling methodology, what we anticipate learning, and a little more about Deacons' role in the study. Thank you. So we're taking a unique approach in our study in that we are sampling from specific companies within our region and doing a clustered sampling approach. Um, that allows us to get some information at more of the company level, um, as well as then take that aggregate information to get a good cross-section of our entire population in the area and get some answers as far as that apply to the whole um, county and region. So um, for that, Part of this study, we're actually in working in coordination with the biostatistics team that is doing the statewide study. Um, and so that allows us to potentially combine our data with their data um, and make sure that what we're doing is complementary to what the state is doing. Thanks, Dr. Garcia. And we do also want to point out that um, in addition to working with people who are employed, we wanted to make sure that as we did this analysis of, of the prevalence in the community, we also included the underserved, those who might not be employed, and those from minority populations. So we also have a component of what we're doing to make sure we address that issue as well. All right, and next I'd like to introduce uh, Mayor Lloyd Winnicky. Mayor Winnicky uh, has been a strong proponent and supporter of this initiative from the beginning. Is gonna talk with, with us a little about why he believes the study is gonna be helpful for local business leaders and policy. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, when we announced our reopen task force a couple of weeks ago, we were purposefully vague on what the testing component would be. And I think I admitted members of the media, you understand why now. Uh, there are a lot of complexities to this research pro uh, project. Dr. Becker and his colleagues at Deepness have taken this amount of time to pull this together. It's immensely uh, complicated. There are a lot of layers to this. And uh, before we announce any of the details, we have to make sure all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. I think this is important for a lot of reasons. This data will help guide policymakers, both statewide and regionally, with how best businesses can reopen, how best society can return to a sense of normalcy. Um, we're all waiting with uh, great anxiety to see what the governor says tomorrow. Um, we anticipate, we use his previous words, that. Uh, the state will open slowly. So as this data is revealed, uh, it will be very helpful to policymakers across uh, the region and state as they develop guidance on how to proceed. I think also it will help employers and employees with their sense of comfort as things get back to, uh, quote, normal, unquote. Uh, employees want to feel comfortable that their workplace is safe. And employers want to make sure that they're doing everything possible to make sure their employees are safe. So I think this test and this research project will go a long way to increase uh, the, the comfort level of both uh, employers and employees. And last, and, and probably the least important, but uh, it's important from a big picture, and that is it, it really raises the profile of the Indiana, Indiana University School of Medicine Evansville's profile in terms of clinical research. This is really, really critical. Uh, this was one piece of why a lot of people lobbied for expanded medical school presence in Evansville. And Dr. Becker and all the colleagues here at Deaconess are doing uh, great work, and this will certainly help uh, lay the foundation for future uh, clinical research through the IU School of Medicine in Evansville. Thank you, Mayor Winnikeem. Before I introduce our, our last speaker, I did also want to point out um, Greg Foles, who leads Deaconess's uh, research institutes here with us today, Greg, along with um, our lead investigator and co-investigators, have already submitted this study to an institutional review board for approval. So we have already received the appropriate approval. And to Mayor Winnicky's point, we want, didn't want to get the cart before the horse on some of those things. There are definitely a number of important steps 
that are necessary to be able to have an approved study that you do on human subjects. So we've already jumped through those hoops and we're really ready to go. So our last uh, speaker this morning is Dr. Stephen Becker. Dr. Becker is the Associate Dean and Director of the IU School of Medicine, Evansville. Dr. Becker will talk with us about IU and Deaconess's collaboration and some more about just generally the collaborative effort that it's taken to get this launched. Thanks, Dr. Porter. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to say that this project started a little bit over two weeks ago. And for those of you that are not researchers or in this area, the idea of having an idea and actually launching a research project in less than three weeks is amazing. And it really only happens when you have what we have built in southwestern Indiana between our hospital partners, our legislative partners, the School of Medicine, and our business community. Um, without our business community, we could not have done this. So in reality, over the last two and a half to three weeks, we started out with an idea. We determined that we could do that here. And in a lot of ways, we'll be leading this kind of research, certainly for a regional area within a country. Um, so it's, it's very exciting time right now. The group that we have worked with to actually get this approved, to secure the sites to do the uh, research, and to be ready to launch it next Monday is truly um, uh, impressive for a community to work together like this. Deaconess has been incredible to work with, um, and uh, we're very excited um, to get this project going and to get some data on our region. The, the study is gonna focus predominantly on Vandenberg County um, so that we will have an assessment of that county in particular um, what we do here, though, certainly can be done in other counties. I actually have reached out to several other counties. There is interest to be involved. But because of the complexity of getting this done, we needed to move faster so that our data would be out sometime in mid-May so that it will really help drive decisions that the mayor um, needs to uh, have to open up our city. Yeah, another important component of the planning was to make sure that we had a statistically significant sample so that when we come forward with the numbers and they're able to be published and released, we will know that it has statistical meaning. Uh, and so we know that our sample size within the population of Annenberg County is going to accomplish that for us. All right, we would be happy to uh, take some questions. I guess my first question is just, I know that this study is going to give you all a lot of information and um, answer a lot of questions that you don't have answers to right now, but for the public, when a lot of this data is released, and I know it's probably dependent on what you find out, but what are some things that the public can expect to hear after this is all said and done? Dr. Coley, you want to take that? This study should answer who has had the disease percentage-wise of the sample which should be able to be translated or projected on our current population. So it will tell us uh, who do we think had it, what percentage of people have had it, because we hear a lot of people saying, I think I had it, I felt I had it, my cousin was this sick. We're going to be able to tell whether your perception reflects with the reality. So that's the first thing. The other thing is we're going to have an answer to how many people are walking around with antibodies that didn't know before whether they saw the disease, got the disease, or didn't get it. That's another very important point. The third thing is that we also have the employers have some sense of um, security in making their decisions and going back to business. Do we have to go back in phases, or can we open up a little bit uh, faster? And because this is not a study that only encompasses the workforce, but also has the uh, underserved uh, population, we will also know how that population fares, also how it translates to other comorbidities. Uh, and it is really stratified very well. So we will know by age group, by gender, by comorbidity, uh, by job type, maybe even possibly by industry, even possibly. Dr. Garcia, anything you'd like to add? I think Dr. Kelly covered it very well. Um, I think it's important
Yeah, so I'll just add to that answer. I think there hasn't been enough, as much testing clinically as any of us would like to this point, which has left a lot of people, as Dr. Poliot points out, saying, I had something at some point. I wonder if it was COVID-19. Uh, so while this study won't answer that question specifically for one of those individuals, unless they happen to be one of the ones randomly selected to participate, it will give us a better idea of did a whole bunch of people have it and we didn't know it, or is the prevalence still pretty low in our community? Um, and so I think the other part of this virus that's very difficult for us is that so many people do either have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. Again, I think there are a lot of people running around out there who saying, well, I never felt sick, but maybe my whole neighborhood has had it and I'm immune at this point. So again, I think it's gonna give us a better sense as a community for what percent of the population with a statistically significant uh, study has actually had it? The other thing I would add is it also gives us a snapshot of where we're at next week when we start. But that can serve as a platform so that we are, we're hopeful that this thing goes away. But everyone's worried there may be a relapse. So it gives us a baseline of where we're at right now that in the future, we could go back and repeat the same thing and be able to get an assessment of is it worse, is it better, or has it stayed the same? Will you all be able to give any updates from this study, or will it kind of be the final results from every single study? Very important point, uh, and you're actually, I was going to answer that question. Uh, the results should be out rapidly, and it would be a one time result. However, this is like Lego pieces we can get multiple places of Dr. Becker mentioned and multiple counties to do it. So it would be layers upon layers of information. So this study would come up with one set of results, and as we get more building blocks of that, maybe we're gonna have more and more results, a bigger and bigger picture of what's going on. So there, there are multiple stages to clinical research being released, and sometimes it is appropriate to release some of the data early but at the end of the day, research studies really are only valid once they've been peer reviewed. Um, so th there would be multiple stages along the way where parts of the information might be available, but there is a point in the end where you've released it, other people who do research have looked at it, validated that your methods were appropriate, that your statistics were appropriate, that your analysis was appropriate, and therefore that your results are meaningful, and that would certainly come a little ways down the road. Yes. Can you hear me first of all? We can hear you. Yeah. So the question is, what would we do in terms of informing a subject and then working with the company? Dr. Abbott, you want to take that? Because these results um, are going to be reported to the state of Indiana, so that patient or that individual will be followed just like any other patient that we have. So they would be notified to let them know of their positive result, and then they would get advice from the Indiana State Department of Health in terms of how um, they would need to um, isolate and what steps they would need to take in order to seek uh, potential care thereafter. Additionally, it helps us contact, uh, contact trace that individual. So um, as Dr. Porter pointed out, if uh, we had unlimited testing supplies, we likely would have been able to test a larger pool of individuals in which um, we know in the country we just aren't able to do that currently. So this gives us also the ability to look at those patients that previously would not have qualified or those individuals that previously would not have qualified for a test and be able to see whether or not we can stop that transmission from that patient. So So that would be part of the contact tracing, just like we do with any other person who gets tested and is found to be positive. There would be contact tracing done by, at this point, the county health department, and they would work with that individual and then potentially their employer to determine what were the appropriate steps. So one of the unique things about a study like this is these are real life people who maybe have a real life infection. And while we're not doing it in order to find more people in the community who have COVID-19, inevitably that will be part of what happens. So sort of a happy side effect of testing this kind of a large number of people is we probably will identify some people who are contagious and don't know it and be able to slow the spread, at least in the circle that they would have been around 
as a result of discovering that they're positive at this point. So we will observe confidentiality and, and the HIPAA rules just like we would if they were a patient rather than a subject who was pre presenting for care. So that information would only be shared with them as a patient in the health department through the state. The company will get aggregate information, but from a HIPAA perspective, that's protected health information for the individual. As you know, probably by now, HIPAA laws have been relaxed to a certain extent, and certainly health departments have great latitude with regard to confidentiality in order to protect the public health. So anytime a person is found to be positive, the health department absolutely has the authority to tell whomever they deem appropriate that that's the case in order to protect the public health. Can you repeat that question? Are you revealing We aren't going to reveal that at this point. Um, you know, there are a lot of privacy issues, uh, confidentiality issues that go along with clinical research and studies. And while there's no preclusion on companies and individuals who do participate in studies to disclose that they've done that, we don't feel like it's appropriate for us to do that disclosure. Dr. Porter. Garcia, you want to tackle that one? Sure. I should clarify, we're, we are covering the broad range of industries, both essential and non-essential. Um, so some people in, involved in this study have not gone back to work. They have been um, staying at home during the past uh, you know, several weeks. Um, and, and the other you know, thing associated with that from a statistical point of view, we were very careful in our sampling process to make sure that we're getting a wide cross-section of the population in terms of demographics, in terms of income level, in terms of all of these sorts of factors uh, to make sure that we're accurately representing the community. And because we knew that specifically working with companies would just get at people who are employed, we also have another arm of this that's going to address people who may or may not be employed and who are more underserved and represent potentially more minority populations that might be represented at those companies. In the questionnaire, we do ask participants if they did abide by the stay at home uh, directives. And we see what the results would be whether those who were good turned out better than those who were not good. Yes, yeah, so the test that we, um, the location that we're sending it to is Mayo Clinic, and they are an extraordinary laboratory. So we have chosen them specifically to partner with because we know that the tests that they perform have a high level of accuracy. And so for PCR tests that are currently being performed, um, that exceeds in terms of the sensitivity uh, and specificity of 95%. So the ones that are out there that are detecting the virus itself are really, really um, great tests. And so with regards to the antibody test, the specificity that I believe is published on the Mayo Clinic website is uh, additionally above 95%. So we really think that in choosing this vendor um, for participation in this study, that we've really selected the highest quality laboratory for testing. That's my question, probably for Mayor Wendy. I know, um, of course, you mentioned earlier we're waiting for uh, Governor Holcomb to make decisions tomorrow about the stay at home order. Uh, we've even seen in Indianapolis the mayor there and uh, I think some other leaders in Marion County mentioned they're going to extend their stay at home order through May 15th, despite whatever happens tomorrow from the governor's office. So I guess my question for you is in making your decisions for what's best here locally, what aspects of your decision making might be dependent on the results of this study? Well, we'll continue to follow the information that is provided from the Vanderbilt County Health Department, which we think is extraordinarily accurate. And so we're tracking the number of new cases per day. Uh, we believe that we, uh, in Vanderbilt County, the city of Evansville, we believe that we, I believe that we meet the first phase of the federal guideline. Um, so 
but we also know that we can't get out in front of the governor and we will respect the state guidance that is issued tomorrow. Uh, we understand that the situation in Evansville and Vandenberg County is very much different than what's going on in Indianapolis and Marion County. And we've communicated that to the governor and his team as well because we hope that guidance uh, that is issued tomorrow uh, allows for a difference in uh, numbers across the state. So if one region is performing better, maybe has more, more leniency to reopen on a faster pace than say other other regions of the state that don't. So we'll be uh, watching the governor's uh, briefing tomorrow very closely. I'm sure we'll have more to say it after that tomorrow. My question is also for the mayor. Uh, you made the announcement that you plan to reopen golf courses this weekend. What kind of thought process went into that? And then with the course things being as fluid as they are, uh, is this kind of just a test to see if they can stay open for now? Or how confident are you that you can keep those businesses uh, we made the announcement, uh, I think with a, with a caveat that pending uh, further guidance from the state uh, tomorrow that may say, hey, this is a this is wrong or a bad idea. Um, so we believe that with the guidelines and the social distancing that is uh, that has been that have been developed by the golf professionals uh, at our suggestion, uh, I think you, we can practice social distancing. People can be outside and enjoy the weather. Uh, but if the governor announces something totally different that contradicts that, we will rescind that tomorrow, but we have every belief that we should be able to do that and be safe and protect protect golfers uh, that come out to take advantage of our great facilities. All right, can we, can we get clarification on the dates? You said it's going to start Monday, five days, so Monday through Friday next week, and the results So I think we feel pretty confident in our ability to get the samples collected over the course of about a week. We're in the process of scheduling those now. And as Dr. Coley a lot said, the early response has been really robust. So we're optimistic that we'll be able to get that done. With regard to when the results are actually available, I think we might be getting the cart before the horse a little bit to get too many predictions out on that. We'll need to get those tests out, get the results back, do a fair amount of analysis on them before we are able to release any kind of results uh, publicly. So. I, I would be hesitant to do too much predicting on that. But certainly, we're trying to move as quickly as possible to the mayor and Dr. Becker's point. Part of why we wanted to move quickly on this is in the hopes that we can get useful information out that will be informative to the region. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you coming out, and uh, be safe out there.